From downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for June 28th, 2024. Checking the calendar, the Cubs are in town for the weekend, and the city will be knee-deep with Cubs fans coming to Wrigley North. It's also a middle weekend of Summerfest. Keith Urban is at the main stage Saturday, and have you heard? Vinyl records are coming back. If you'd like to add to your collection, the Milwaukee Records Show is happening Sunday at Four Points Sheridan at the airport. <laughs> All right. Michigan Republican State Representative Neil Frisky was arrested after he reportedly chased a stripper from his home with a gun. Just to be clear, it was the state representative who had the gun, not the stripper. <laughs> and the police blotter read they had a disagreement. I'm going to go out on a limb here and think that the disagreement was about money. <laughs> and I'm not thinking a non-disclosure agreement is in the works. <laughs> Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill making it legal to kill crack bears, but only in self-defense. I got a question. How do you know the bears on crack? <laughs> Is there so much in, so much crack in Florida that the bears is, that the bears on crack all the time? Is there such a thing? <laughs> and one more question: I know why bears live in Florida. Free crack. <laughs> well, why do people get moving there? And finally, it was a classic <laughs> case of going from the outhouse to the penthouse. At the Olympic trials in Oregon, less than an hour before her semifinal 400 meter sprint, Kendall Ellis was trapped in a porta potty. She was banging on the door and screaming for someone to let her out. Thankfully, someone did, and she won the race, and, and she's going to Paris. <laughs> on the podcast today, we have Art Rothschild, Steve Giles, Joel Dresang, and with a recap of the week, here's Kyle Tedding. Well, thanks, Max. A bit of a mixed week overall. NASDAQ able to put in a positive return for the week, up two-tenths of a percent, 43 points on the week. But the S&P and Dow both negative, down a tenth of a percent each. The S&P down four points and the Dow down 27 after a 41-point decline on Friday for the Dow. For the year, NASDAQ up 18.6%, the S&P up 15.3%, and the Dow up 48 all including dividends. You know, Art, we've got a first quarter in the books here, or rather a second quarter in the books here now, how quickly the year's getting away from us. Um, another solid, mostly smooth quarter. Yeah, the occasional bump, the occasional bruise along the way, but it really has been a good stretch of just positive returns for stocks broadly, but even more importantly for some of the high flyers, some of the bigger growth names. Uh, I just did a quick back of the, the napkin calculation, the S&P up a little more than 3.9% in the quarter, not including dividends. Um, NASDAQ a little more, Dow a little less. But what are your takeaways from a first quarter that seems to have been mostly positive? Yeah, uh, this quarter, half a year to date, whole year, um, has nice, I'm going to use the term texture to it. Uh, we've been making money now for uh, really, all, it seems like weeks on end, uh, very little volatility. Um, that's that's really a hallmark of, of this expansion that we're, we're in. Um, the economy, you know, Joel will get into some numbers later, but um, not much to be concerned about. Uh, the Fed and interest rates, you know, he'll get into this as well, I'm sure. Uh, decent numbers on inflation, um, you know, year to date. Um, but when you look at the figures, I mean, you're showing 15%, over 15% up in the S&P. Um, we could close the books right now. You could sell everything you've got, which we're not recommending, by the way, um, and, and buy a CD paying, you know, 5% for the next six months, 5% plus, and then the year close to 20%. And again, we don't time the markets. It, there's the possibility that anything could go higher, you know, for the rest of the year. Anything could go lower. But regardless of what's happening at any point in time, we're always looking further out. And over long periods of time, the money we have in the stock market, we expect to do well, and as it has now for years, months, uh, you know, weeks, really. And uh, anything can fall at any point in time. But so this is not changing anything we're doing, but it's been a, just a tremendous year so far. You know, I think normally I count on Steve to give the balance uh, a part of the take. I think he did a pretty good job covering it. But Steve, maybe something to touch on here mm -hmm. is that despite the fact that stocks look a little expensive, I don't think it takes away from the role that they play in our portfolio. 
And conversely, just because bonds look maybe a little bit cheaper now than they have in a long time, I don't think it means you go too far the other direction. Maybe just give us a minute on kind of the role that each play. Yeah, and, and you know, times like this, as in, as uh, we look at the market and what it's done so far this year, S&P up over 15%, there is that inclination to want to put more money into stocks. Uh, but to your point here, Kyle, about balance, uh, don't discount your other asset classes. Uh, on a relative valuation basis moving forward, I actually think that bonds provide the most um, – possible up to, upside in relative terms over the next 12 to 24 months. And this has everything to do with, one, how well the stock market has done up to now, two, how poorly bonds have done up to now, uh, three, the expectation that the Fed is going to be coming uh, more dovish uh, as the year progresses. Uh, and, I, and I hate to say that the Fed is going to lower rates once, twice, three times. I, I don't think that that's fair uh, to to paint them into a corner. But if the Fed does enter into a period of more dovishness, you're going to see bonds continue to uh, have price reappreciation, and that's going to be on top of uh, their already much higher yields than they were a couple of years ago. And I think that for those investors who are – who are kind of ignoring what they're getting in fixed income are missing the point of a well-balanced portfolio. It's really about everything working together. And while most of our, our returns this year, Kyle, have come from the stock side, uh, over longer periods of time, five, eight, 10 years, it's a combination of how stocks and bonds work together. And maybe our, one of the challenges we have right now then is that because bond returns have been fairly weak for a long time and because cash looks like such an attractive alternative to that, you've convinced, not you, but you know those rates have convinced a lot of investors that maybe they just want to hang out in cash for a while longer. There's a comfort there, certainly, but also with where yields are, it's been a pretty positive trade to, to do away with some of the risk we saw in bonds, some of the volatility that we weren't used to. And just take cash, and there's maybe now a risk that we might hang out there too long. Yeah, great lead into the fact there was a, a really good article in the Wall Street Journal this week talking about a cash trap. Too many people putting too much money, you know, in cash, and then when interest rates decline, they'll be forced to find something that's going to do better for them, um, and they will have missed an opportunity, for example, to have bought bonds, you know, paying more at an earlier time uh, when they were cheaper. Um, I see that article a couple different ways, and I see that point a couple different ways. Um, as one of the older uh, members in the room today, um, I have to say I love cash, totally love cash. And, and the fact that I can get 5% on cash today and CDs or money markets, um, I'm just loving it. And I don't feel personally that I'm going to be trapped when interest rates go down because I expect them to go down. Um, and furthermore, having cash, and I'm, I'm speaking as an advisor and as an investor, it makes me more willing, perhaps, to take more risk. So if you look at stocks like NVIDIA that we've talked about before on the show or the others of the Magnificent Seven that did well last year, maybe Amazon, you know, more so this year, um, having that cash maybe even enables older investors to take more risk and isn't necessarily a trap. Now, the other side of that is bonds over time, you know, as Steve just, you know, pointed out, are an important port part of a portfolio. So when the, you know, cash is only paying three, well, you want those bonds, though, still to be paying four because you're taking risk when you buy those bonds. So a real question long term is, where's the federal deficit going or, or the federal debt and what's going to happen in the future? Once again, spread it around, have cash, you know, and at six trillion in, in, in money markets so far, I'm not sure how far down that's going to go. In, in, in the near future. So I like having everything. You know, and I, and I have found, I think, psychologically that investors, savers, retirees like knowing they've got five, six, seven months worth of cash set aside for their withdrawals, whether it's to meet their RMDs, whether it's to meet their just monthly expenses for cash flow, knowing that the money's not sitting idle. I mean, 5% is a pretty juicy yield on, on a money market yield. And when you compare that with what bonds are currently paying somewhere in the 4.5% range, um, cash looks like the winner. Uh, the, the important takeaway here for our listeners is that nine months from now, 18 months from now, in a falling rate environment, you're going to miss out on the upside in the cash 
the yield will fall as the Fed lowers rates, but you're going to get the benefit of the upside reappreciation on your bonds because values of bonds always move in the inverse of rate changes. So the point here, Art, I think, and, and to just sort of tie this one up with a nice little bow is cash is absolutely important for your short-term needs. Uh, venture out into bonds for something that is certainly safer than a stock, but you want to do a little bit better than your cash. And then stocks are for the money that you know you don't need for, for seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. No, I think that's a great point. And, you know, just a step further beyond the idea of cash trap, if instead you think of cash as optionality, the, the potential to do something later on, not all of your money needs to be in the market. Not all of your money needs to be invested in bonds. I think for most investors, it makes sense to have most of it invested. You want to participate in those opportunities. The upside of bonds when rates fall, as Steve points out, but there is a role for savers and retirees alike, right? For those that are spending in, those that are adding to their portfolios, for a portion of their portfolio that they can access when they want to buy deals. When the stock market goes down a little bit and they go, you know what? I didn't have a, a place to get that from in my bank account, but I like the fact that I've got that short term bond or that cash position that I can get access to. And so I think, you know, it's, it's all a function of how you navigate the opportunity set factoring in that there's always an opportunity cost. If I don't invest that cash, what am I missing out on? Well, if it was money de destined for stocks, you've missed out on a lot right now. And so you got to be careful. But if it was money you wanted to keep safe, well, okay, you could have done short-term bonds. You would have gotten a similar return. Long-term, you're going to be a little better off in those bonds than you are in cash. But there is that optionality. And that's part of what you're paying for. You know, Joel Art set you up earlier with a bunch of things that we need you to talk about on the economic front. I think more, more critical than just about anything, uh, we had some data on personal spending out this week that gave us a little more insight into that PCE number that the Fed so heavily relies on. That's the personal consumption expenditure number. And yeah, that's the, the Fed's favorite uh, measure of inflation. And uh, we had numbers uh, today that showed that the the year-to-year uh, PCE index went up 2.6%. So that's closer to the 2% target that the Fed has long range. It's two years away from when it was 7.1%, So, uh, which was the highest in about four decades. So the, the things that the Fed has been doing to, to raise the interest rates, to try to slow down the economy, um, seem to be having that effect. It's probably not going fast enough for some people. Um, but, but, you know, and, 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 you know, the, uh, remember last year they brought it down a lot and, um, and now we're, we've been sort of surprised, uh, this year so far because it went up a little actually. And, um, now it's back to that 2.6 level, which is closer to two than to 7.1. Um, the other number, uh, is, is the core PCE and that, takes the, the, the index and eliminates volatile uh, costs for energy and food. Um, and that actually got down to also 2.6%. That's the lowest that has been since March of 2021. So, um, so those are good signs. But again, it's showing that the economy is slowing. So a lot of the data we're looking at are, are signs that uh, the economy is slowing. And sometimes you think, oh, well, that's not good to have the economy slow, but that's what we want. And then on the housing front, some new records again for housing prices, even as maybe the turnover in housing and new home sales, the kind of measures of quantity versus price not pointing to a market that's moving all that quickly. Right. Yeah. That's, and that's one of the, the house, that's, housing is one of the, the conundrums. It's one of the, the uh, price, uh, indicators that that has been keeping in, inflation overall at a higher level and it's one that a lot of people feel and and feel strongly about um and we had numbers from the S&P core logic case Schiller home price index we had numbers from the commerce department on new home sales we had uh, numbers of pending home sales prices uh from the uh the National Association of Realtors they're all showing that the housing market is uh, weaker, um, but the prices are still high, which is 
again, kind of confusing because uh, we're seeing that demand is is uh, waning because of the the high interest rates, which is what the Fed wanted. Um, but the demand is still pretty strong, um, strong enough that uh, because of of those uh, the, the the low inventory of houses. Um, th- that the, the prices are still going up. Um, the, the National Association of Realtors was spinning it forward a little and saying that we're actually seeing uh, more houses in the pipeline and that we're not expecting, they're not expecting uh, interest rates to be going up as much anymore. In fact, maybe coming down a little. Um, so that's all going to help uh, the, 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 the affordability of housing. You know, you use the word confusing and kind of talking about the housing market. I think we can look at consumers and whether it's sentiment or confidence or any measure of how consumers feel. There's quite a bit of confusing information out there as well. You know, I think broadly speaking, we've said the economy is still strong enough. And yet we often are hearing that yeah, people don't always feel it. We got some news on consumers this week and kind of what they're thinking. And again, mixed data. Right. Uh, we've got the consumer confidence numbers from the the um, conference board. And then the uh, University of Michigan has a study on consumer sentiment. Both of those are, again, showing that um, uh, compared to a couple of years ago, that Confidence and outlook and expectations are a lot stronger, um, but but two years ago was like a record low, a, lo- a low point for how consumers felt, um, and, and and we're still historically pretty low. Uh, people aren't feeling all that confident, even though uh, the the job market is strong, even though you know wages are are, are moving faster than inflation, which you know, we want. Um, but, but people still have the feeling that prices are too high. And yeah, I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident in my job, but I'm hearing of other people losing their jobs. And I don't know at one point, you know, I'll be able to afford these prices. I think the feedback loop there is just absolutely incredible, Joel. And, and this juxtaposition between people complaining about inflation, yet TSA announced that they, they set a record, um, that the ten seven of the ten busiest travel days in the history of TSA happened in the last month. Yeah. So we're back not only right. to pre-pandemic levels, but we're setting records for people traveling. That means they're out there spending money. Right. And and even in the face of what is um, higher prices, even though inflation has come down, consumers are spending because they can. They have jobs. They're working. People are spending money. And uh, I think that's a lot of why this – economy is probably going to pull off the soft landing that the Fed is hoping for. And and if the consumer stays engaged, uh, I think that Powell can keep rates where they are for a while, even in the face of some of these more pessimistic uh, consumer sentiment numbers. Right. Yeah. And it's, and it's the sort of thing where, you know, people are, they speak more pessimistically. I mean, their, their arms are filled with, with, you know, Shopping bags, and and yet they're saying that, that you know, I hate how much all this they costs. They didn't feel so good about the economy. <laughs> but but it's exactly why, as you suggest, the Fed is keeping rates higher. As soon as they lower rates, people are going to think, okay, it's time to party, and maybe they'll spend more. So you want this? There's a negativity bias already in the media that keeps people thinking that things are worse than they are. Um, but once the Fed starts lowering rates, it could be you know party like it's you know 1999, which, which could lock in inflation at a higher level. That's than right. The That's why they want to be want. very hesitant yeah. you know, to do that. Well, we should be clear also that we are still not that far out from a global pandemic. And yeah. there were all kinds of unintended consequences of shutting down travel for the better part of a year, 18 months, all kinds of consequences of pumping in, whether it was $2 trillion from the federal government or maybe $4 trillion from the Fed, of pumping that money into the system often with nowhere for it to go because the things you normally spent it on, restaurants, going to the movies, taking that trip to Europe, you just weren't doing for the better part of two years. And so, you know, I look at TSA's travel numbers, 3 million travelers going through today, probably the first time they'll hit 3 million ever and go, well, yeah, but all of those were trips that were supposed to happen, or not all of them, but a lot of them were trips that were supposed to happen two years ago. And people finally feeling confident about getting back out. It's no wonder that You know, maybe some of that services-based inflation spiked and has stuck around. It's no wonder that things that we were spending money on when we could two years ago, now we're not spending quite as much because we've transitioned some of that spending. Maybe the holdover of all that stimulus money is finally starting to wear its way off of consumer balance sheets. And so I think you look at this environment and go, well, 
something's not right here. Well, no, you better believe something's not right. We came through a period in time in which the whole world was turned upside down and we're still trying to sort out which way is the right way up. And so, you know, I think if you really boil down what what are the problems out there right now? Yeah, there's cracks here and there. Consumer spending from a credit card perspective has picked up a little bit. Auto loan auto loan delinquencies have picked up a little bit. There's little signs that yeah, things aren't perfect. But when you look big picture at the news Joel reports every week, when you look at kind of the way we're viewing the world, I think strong enough is probably the way I would put it for the economy right now. You know, those of uh, uh, those of you listening right now, uh, coming through the website, probably seeing some new colors, a new logo, some new things on the website uh, that uh, you know we're pretty proud uh, of uh, getting uh, getting crossed off the list here, Joel. Um, it's been yeah, nine months in the works now, I'd say, on a new website, but really the better part of uh, a decade plus since we had gone through the process. It was time. Yeah, we we last revised had a big revision of of the website in 2010, so it's it's been a while. Um, and yeah, um, the you know we, we worked with a local firm called Lightburn. Um, they're experts in this sort of thing. Um, we liked them because they're very um, customer focused. Um, our customers, not just seeing us as customers, but seeing the clients and the the people who follow us as customers. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that they help do a very good job of, of, um, helping us be who we are. Um, but, but also making us a little more dynamic and, and, um, uh, more easily to navigate, uh, for our, our listeners, our customers, our followers. Yeah. And I think, you know, I highlighted in the newsletter that's going out this afternoon, but one of the things that was clear back in 2010 or maybe not clear, but clear now is that so many folks have transitioned from traditional laptop or PC computers to an iPad or a phone for the vast majority of their internet browsing, including checking statements, including, hey, let me just get that stock quote quick. They're not sitting at a desk anymore. They're sitting on their couch. And so we needed a website that was more responsive to that. They're waiting in the TSA check line. There you go. <laughs> They're looking at their watches too. Yeah. They, yeah. they absolutely are. We needed a website not only that was more responsive to those types of situations, but that was more responsive to just accessibility broadly and making it available to uh, to everyone uh, in whatever format it is that they want to browse. Right. Yeah. The the the. One thing that I like about it is that the the contrasts of the colors are a lot better, and and so for people visu- visually impaired or have having challenges, I think it's easier to to bring it in. Well, we welcome feedback, especially positive feedback. If you have <laughs> criticisms, Joel's your guy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if you if you don't get our newsletter, if you haven't been to the website recently, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, as I said, we'll have a newsletter coming out this afternoon. I think highlighting some of uh, the importance of uh, this this website update for us. Beyond that, we enjoy doing the program for you. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at landis.com. <laughs>